Love staying informed? Subscribe now and get unlimited access to local news, weather, and sports for just 99 cents a month for your first three months at inform.news join. Read every story, listen to every podcast, and download the apps that keep you informed and on the go 24 hours a day. So head to inform.news slash join right now to subscribe. What are you waiting for? Get three months of local news for just 99 cents a month at inform.news slash join. Welcome to Plain Talk. And, you know, I've, I've been writing and talking a lot lately about the North Dakota Republican Party reorganizing, and that's going to be happening this weekend. Uh, we talked about it at length uh, on the last show. Um, it, this weekend is going to be a consequential thing. The North Dakota Republican Party is uh, the, the dominant political organization in our state, and there may be a very sharp change in what that the leadership of the party looks like um, happening this weekend. But the other North Dakota's other uh, political party, or not the only one, but the Democratic NPL, they've already reorganized. They already have a new leader. His name's Adam Goldwyn, and he joins this episode of Plain Talk along with uh, my co-host, Ben Hansen. Adam, how you doing? Great. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Give us a little bit of your background. Um, Where did you start in politics? How did you get involved in politics? Tell us about yourself. Sure. Well, I was born and raised in Portland, Oregon. I've uh, always been uh, uh, from a political family. There's a photo <laughs> of my older brother when he was seven months old uh, in the campaign office of the then governor candidate. Uh, my mom was working as the treasurer. Um, so uh, there's a funny letter uh, from John Updike to my great grandmother uh, saying, um, keep up the good work as a suffragette in Helena, Montana. So I come from a long way. Now was, you know, 1910, 1920, something like that. So uh, it was always in my family, always in the, always in our mind to be, uh, you know, trying to help working people, trying to help immigrants, trying to help, uh, you know, anybody try to, to fulfill their American dream. Myself, I got my start. Uh, I moved to Fargo in 2014, January. To um, uh, I, I'm a professor of English at North Dakota State University, and uh, so I just started uh, looking around at the state of public education in the state and uh, started to see the broken dreams of our students uh, who, because of the political system and because of the way that the economy was shifted towards uh, uh, oil extraction and that money was being sent mostly out of the state, um, the way that uh, the sort of social uh, policies of the Republican supermajority were really just driving young people out of the state and, and taking away their dreams. And so that sort of motivated me to um, get started. Uh, I was the, I am still the chair of the District 11 Democrats in Fargo. And, um, and so I've just sort of become more and more involved in the party um, from there. Adam, can you describe, most folks don't ever consider becoming uh, district chair, let alone a statewide political party chair, they might really not know what that is. They might see the title on a CNN interview, or in our case, we might see something on the forum here with a, an individual quote, but you don't know too much about the person. And uh, we here uh, on Plain Talk uh, kind of fancy ourselves as an in the weeds podcast. Could you let folks know um, you've been chair now for, I believe, a short time. Is that correct? Uh, of the state party? Yes. Yes, I was elected state party chair. I think it was the end of April. Um, Got it. Could, yeah. Could, could you let folks know kind of what a day in the life is of a chair? What do you do? And uh, like, how how much does this position pay? How long is it? How do you become a chair? Pe most people don't even consider these types of things. And I think it'd be informative for our listeners. Yeah. So this, this role of state party chair is a volunteer position. I don't get any money for it. Um, I do it purely because I believe in the um, political positions of the Democratic Party, and I believe that the Democratic Party, both uh, at the local level and at the national level, is the uh, best hope we have uh, to let Americans have the kind of life that uh, I believe that Americans should have. Um, and so to become chair of District 11, which is the Fargo district, I literally just walked into the Democratic NPL office and said, like, what district do I live in? And what can <laughs> And they said, well, where do you, what's your address? Hold them. And they said, okay, well, you have your, you live in district 11. You have your monthly meeting on the third Thursday at five 30. And I walked into the district meeting and I just said, what can I do to help? Uh, 
And then from there, I got more and more involved in political organizing. Um, I put myself through graduate school as a union organizer for the Professional Staff Congress, uh, uh, AFL-CIO affiliate for educators, literally going door to door asking other um, educators and graduate students to sign union cards. So I was familiar with the um, basics of um, union organizing, which uh, transfers very easily to political organizing. And then I just saw that there was more to be done. You know, <laughs> listeners of this podcast, if you're in the weeds, you know that the Democratic NPL is not uh, at the strength that it once was in the state. No, I don't. I don't think you need to be in the weeds <laughs> to uh, to have observed that. No, no offense, but I mean, it's it's not exactly a secret. Yeah. So uh, there was work to be done, and and I wanted to be the one to do that work. Um, and so the day to day of the state party chair, uh, you know, again, it's a volunteer position. I have a full time job. Uh, so I have to be very, um, you know, conscientious about the use of my time, but a lot of it is calling other democratic activists around the state, trying to help find candidates, trying to help find volunteers. And then the other part of it is more public facing, um, carrying the message of the Dem NPL. Uh, I was at, I was at the North Dakota boys state, uh, yesterday, um, uh, speaking to that group, uh, just about what Democrats stand for. Uh, you know, I'm on this show now, um, so I'm I'm just sort of trying to get uh, carry the democratic message, uh, democratic NPL message more broadly. So uh, you know there really isn't an upper limit on the amount of time that's possible to spend. I, that days had you know 28 hours, and I could devote them all to this. How do you um, how, how how do you because the, the democratic NPL is not going to start to gain traction in the legislature at the ballot box again until you convince a lot of people who have been voting for Republicans to to switch. And I mean, just now, so, some of your rhetoric beginning out here where you say, you know, all the oil extraction money is going to out of state and we have broken dreams. Of, I wonder if there's a lot of North Dakotans who are living their day to day lives, sending their kids to our public schools, watching as the oil industry deposits about one out of every two tax dollars our state collects and sees a gap between reality and and your rhetoric. And I say that as somebody who's been very critical of the the turn that the NDGOP has taken on, you know, social issues. This last legislative session was an embarrassment where we're focused on book bans and a lot of these other things. I, I, I perceived that as a departure from the more pragmatic sort of governance that the Republican party has used to build 30 years of, of, of super majority control in the state. Um, I listened to your rhetoric cause I'm, I'm starting, I, I have been thinking like, okay, I, I think the Republicans are, are uh, some of the Republicans, a faction of the Republicans are moving the party, you know, sort of outside of the window of, of what I think a lot of North Dakota voters find acceptable. Can they find an alternative in the Democratic NPL? And then I hear you talk and I think I, I, I don't think that's going to appeal to, to North Dakota voters who have been voting for Republicans. Well, I mean, I think actually about uh, about you a lot. <laughs> you know, when I first moved to North Dakota, they'd say, oh, here's Rob Port doing it again. And my wife and I, over the past year or two, we keep saying to myself, like, I can't believe I agree. Did you read Rob Pork? I think I agree with Rob Pork. And it seems yeah. to be happening. Welcome. Before. Welcome to the dark side. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I guess it depends which one of us thinks, you know, I think that you're right, that there is a shift in the Republican Party recently. You know, as I said at the top, you know, I, I grew up in Oregon. Oregon had Republican senators uh, my whole life growing up. Uh, and, you know, no one in my family, I was too young to vote, but you know, no one in my family voted for them, but they were fine. They were supportable people. They were honest people with decency and integrity. Uh, uh, and I think that's probably fairly true of, you know, I think of the pre run for president, Doug Burgum, you know, he wasn't, I wouldn't vote for him, but I don't think it's unreasonable to understand why. So why he has such a high approval rating in the state, but I think that's not uh, the Republican party of the past six months, year, two years. And I think um, if you look at where the Republican Party will be, I mean, this is a debate that they're currently having about uh, the Republican state party chair, right? Uh, what will the Republican Party be like in a year, two years, four years? Um, I think that that is not, uh, that's a, that some large percentage of people who currently vote Republican and have in their past voted Democrat, right? It was not so long ago that, uh, you know, most people who've pulled a, a lever for a Republican have also at some point in their lives pulled a lever for a Democrat. Sure. Uh, and I don't think they want book bans and um, uh, politicians telling you what kind of health care you can get 
and uh, you know what kind of uh, clothes you can wear in public. And uh, I don't think North Dakotans, uh, especially those with sort of more libertarian, small government leaning, uh, the Republican Party in North Dakota is not the party of small government. It's the party of intrusion to your personal, most intimate personal choices, what books you read, what you, who you can love, what kind of medical care you can get. So I think that that presents an opportunity for the Democratic Party uh, to say, actually, you know, your values don't have to change to vote for the Democratic Party. Our values overlap in really substantial ways. Adam, there's a uh, money ball, if you will, aspect to political statewide, especially political party organizing. And in the case of the Democratic NPL trying to build itself uh, back up again, have there been any, uh, ha has there been talks? Is there a decided on plan when you're looking at 2024? Is it a, uh, knowing that there's not really any absolutes, but is there a focus on municipal nonpartisan offices to gain traction? Is it a focus on, you know, if Doug Burgum really is putting all of his, um, I don't know, is all in on this presidential run, there might be an open seat for governor. And I've, I've been present at conversations where, it, you know, the activist or the, you know, the strategic crowd says, you know, we got all chips got to go in for governor or all chips got to go in for these nonpartisan races. We got to, we got to build people up from the grassroots. Um, I, I I, I don't know what your conversations have been like, but what, what can we expect from the Dem NPL uh, message wise and strategically uh, coming up with 2024 next year? Yeah, well, you know, again, we are sort of a volunteer. We're a volunteer party, uh, you know, and I don't get to um, speak for the I am the chair of the Dem NPL, but I don't get to. You know, I don't tell everyone what to do or what to run for. Um, and I think one of the strengths that we have as a party is that, you know, the Williston Dems are going to sit down and think for themselves what uh, message is best for Williston, uh, what candidates are best for Williston, what races are most likely to be won in, in Williston. Um, you know, those are, I, I like to um, distinguish between the formal structure of the Dem NPL uh, and the um, energy that's provided by um, volunteers whose um, uh, policy, desired policy outcomes might overlap. So for instance, um, you know, many of those municipal races that you talked about are nonpartisan. So uh, as such, the Democratic Nonpartisan League uh, isn't planning to um, make a partisan push into those nonpartisan races. But I would say that the activists and volunteers and um, supporters who um, want to see policy changes at their local level that might be affected by a co-op, by an electric co-op, or might want to be, or were affected by a school board, right? Those people will decide for themselves which race is the best to organize uh, and which race is most winnable um, for them. Do you, um, I, I, in terms of candidate recruitment, you know, last cycle, we had a very high profile situation where your U.S. House candidate who received the endorsement at the Dem NPL state convention that I was, I was at Mark Haugen, um, was ultimately pushed out of the race. Now I know ultimately it was his decision. I guess he could have stayed in, but he had a lot of, he, he has said that he had a lot of high profile Democrats calling him, telling him to get out in favor of Karaman, former Miss America who had launched kind of a late independent run. Um, I mean, Haugen clearly felt embittered by that. He ultimately, it has since joined joined the Republican Party. I and I guess my my question what what I've heard some Democrats tell me is that that is going to harm candidate recruitment. That there are going to be candidates who might be thinking about stepping up in maybe into a statewide race or something like that who are afraid that they're going to get pole axed if if a, if something better comes along. H how do you address that? I mean, is the party going to stand behind its candidates going forward? Yeah, well, I think that it's not, I mean, I wasn't, I don't mean this as a dodge, I just simply wasn't involved in any of those discussions or decisions. But I think ultimately, uh, you know, the politicians are um, representative, it's a representative democracy. And I think of it less as someone being so-called forced out, and more of a, a grassroots action of people saying this candidate doesn't represent the values that we 
want to see in an elected official um, and use their right uh, in a. But but know, why didn't those people show up at the state convention where he was selected? We don't want to. We don't want to vote for this person. Yeah, but he was. But he was selected by Democrats at the state convention. I mean, he was. There was a democratic process. They could have turned up to it. They didn't. Or or maybe they did and changed their minds. I don't know. But I mean, he wasn't. I mean, his 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 point of view, obviously his point of view on abortion was was a big was a big part of that. But it wasn't a secret when he was endorsed at the state convention. So you talk about a democratic process. There was one. He was chosen. Well, the the partisan politics of the of the democratic nomination process are not overlap are not you know perfectly overlapping with the actual process of voters in the state. So I think what Mark Haugen was hearing, and again, I'm sort of like uh, speculating because I, I, I simply don't know, but if enough voters tell you they won't vote for you, you know, it, it's not really a matter of partisan yeah. politics. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, uh, I don't think it will harm voter uh, candidate recruitment because uh, candidates have values and those the, it's, Candidates come to us because they want to represent the values that, you know, and the policies that mean something to them, you know, to put your name on a ballot, uh, especially as a, as a Dem NPLer in North Dakota, uh, I, I'm hugely in admiration of anyone who's willing to do that. Um, and I think that it shows someone who truly believes in uh, the values of the Dem NPL, uh, individual flourishing, yeah. you know, Small government in the way that Republicans view small government, but in the way that uh, Dem and PLers view small government, you get to make choices about how to live your own life without government interference. Um, he was, he was and, the top. He was the top vote getter in the previous cycle when he ran for treasurer. He was the p- top vote getter for the Dem and PL on the statewide ballot. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, that that to me very, seemed like a very interesting dynamic. Uh, yeah, Adam. I, oh, go ahead. But go for it. Oh, it's Adam. I, I want to ask. You're the so you're the new chair this year of the North Dakota Democratic NPL party. That means that you have interactions with uh, DNC. And I'll say this: you don't have to get in trouble. Uh, but I, I was wondering how you found your interactions with DNC. For me, I've been frustrated with them as a national party. I, I and I'm sure Republicans get this same thing. But I just I feel like they run a 17 state party now nationally, not to a person. But I just feel like there's not individualized messaging being put out per state that current technology, social media, digital, uh, digital advertising would allow for. There doesn't seem to be, you know, it, it's extremely frustrating for, for me during presidential elections that it's they're basically they're not national elections. I don't feel like I feel like they're six state elections. I'm guessing there are Republicans that feel this way, too. There, there are five million Californians that vote for Donald Trump that will never be represented uh their political viewpoints will never be represented by the state in california and and so it, it's frustrating for me i'm wondering how you as a volunteer dem and pl chair have found your reactions with the dnc uh, you know maybe you disagree or may, maybe you're able to take a voice there uh from a rural state that's different i i don't know yeah it's a good question i um <laughs> so i was the uh a member i mean i still am as chair representing the dnc but in my previous position within the party i was uh called it Committee man. North Dakota gets four representatives to the, the Democratic Party, gets four representatives to the DNC, the chair, vice chair, uh, and then two people of different genders are the committee, currently the committee woman, um, Ruth Buffalo, and the committee man, Jamie Selzler. Um, and I think I thought, like, okay, I'm in now. Like, now I'll actually, I'm on the inside. You know, you hear all this uh, the DNC put his finger on the scales for this, the DNC put his fingers on the scale of the DNC, the DNC. And I thought, haha, Adam, you're at the DNC now. And I got there and I, I mean, what I found was uh, committed activists from all across the country, not really that much different than I am, you know, just trying to help push forward economic justice and racial justice and environmental justice and just truly people committed to, you know, making the world better. And it turned out not to be the cloak and dagger uh, power center that I had hoped it would be. How, uh, how many people asked if North Dakota was a Canadian provenance when you went to D.C.? <laughs> Uh, so uh, uh, it is. Know, it my, is. I, I I can attest. It is kind of shockingly banal when when you get on when you get when you're in the what what, what John Bolton. I always liked the uh, the John Bolton book titled the the room where it happened, um, which which obviously came from from Ham from uh, the Hamilton uh, uh, play or musical. But 
how how banal it is to be in that room at times. I've been in a few of those rooms, and it's just kind of like, uh, boy, this is not uh, – the smoky back room is not as much of an adventure as I thought it was going to be. Smoky nor back. Uh, so, but, uh, you know, I think the, the thing about the DNC, and this is my message sort of broadly to Dem NPLers across the state and anyone who's looking for a change in politics – I think it's a it's often a, a cop out to look and say, well, why isn't the DNC blah blah blah? And it's like we're a representative democracy. Each of us has a citizen obligation to participate in our politics, right? That's a core American value. That there's not some ruling people elsewhere. And you know, I don't know. People maybe look at me and say, oh, that guy's the chair of the party. But I literally eight years ago walked into the office of the Dem NPL and said, like, what district am I in, and what can I do? And I just kept putting my hand up to volunteer for stuff. Uh, so I think it's a, it's kind of a cop out to look and say, why isn't the DNC doing this for us? Why aren't you doing it for you in your own community? Uh, uh, so that's, that's what I, that's my goal is Dem and Pierre to say, let's do this in our own community. There's no other, there's no one else coming to save us. There's no other, you know, deep fat check that's going to cut, that's going to save us. There's no shortcut. There's no silver bullet. The way we're going to gain political strength in North Dakota is by going door to door, phone call to phone call, neighbor to neighbor, telling what the Dem NPL stands for. I'm I'm sure you've seen the uh, heard the Byron Dorgan recalling the it's something it's a founding father story about like, oh, no, who's going to do this? Or it was writing the Constitution. One of the more headline founding fathers said there's nobody. It's only there is only us. Mm -hmm. This is it. This is the room. We're stuck with, you know, and and, and for better or worse, we're stuck with us. So we better come up with something good. Oh, uh, Rob, you were saying. You know, I it's it's I I've been listening and I've I've been writing a lot about, you know, sort of populism. Because I, I we live in a very populist age, and I think a lot of that has to do with social media and and it's driven a lot more engagement, I think, than we've had in the past. But I I also wonder when I when I hear you talking about, well, you know, the, the Williston Democrats are gonna decide what's best for them and the Fargo Democrats will decide what's best for them. And I'm I'm wondering, I mean because there's there's this tension between sort of what the, the the masses want and what's maybe right. Like for instance, looking looking at the Republican primary right now, I mean you have you have Donald Trump under criminal indictment and his support he's consistently pulling over fifty percent. Um, Joe Biden's approval numbers are down in the thirties. Frankly, his approval ratings aren't much better than Donald Trump's, and yet he's probably going to be the the Democratic nominee again to to run. For a second term, and I'm I'm wondering like yes, there are a lot of people showing up, and yes, it's a democratic process. But what if the people are wrong? Like, what if they're making bad choices? Um, and to me, I think that's a very interesting tension because on one hand, like we're all trained, we beat our chest, democracy, the will of the people, and everything. But what if the people are wrong? Um, what if they're making bad decisions? I I don't know. And, and so when I'm hearing you kind of say, well, the Williston Dem is just kind of up to them. And I'm looking over at the North Dakota Republican Party, and they have kind of that problem. The District Two Democrats are basically a Sons of Liberty chapter who have you declared into who, yes. uh, in the District Two Republicans, yes, um, and, and basically have declared independence from the state party and say, like, well, we're just going to do what we're going to do. I don't know that that's necessarily a good thing like like i do think there has to be some structure like 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 the democratic party or the republican party or the libertarian party or the green party whatever it is has to like stand for something and it has to be you know people have to know what they're getting for and so this kind of lucy i and i don't i don't know what point i and i apologize i don't know what question i'm trying to ask you but these are all the things that are running through my mind as i'm observing what's going on and i'm taking a very contrarian point of view again because i know i'm not supposed to be I wouldn't call it anti-democracy, but I am very anti-populist. I I don't think might makes right. I don't think majorities are always right. Um, I think, in fact, they're often wrong. And, and so I guess, can, can you speak to that a little bit as, as somebody who's, who's trying, I guess, to build, in, in, maybe in the context of some of your previous comments? Yeah, well, I think what you pointed is to something that obviously the, the founders of the nation spent a lot of time wrestling with. They didn't make it a direct democracy, right? They right. made it a mixed madison's uh, madison's famous quote was that is even if every single person was plato uh you know we the the the, they would still be a mob right it's so we do you know uh 
local state structures of representative democracy. And then, of course, we do also build in various um, direct democratic checks against the power of the representative aspect, right? Um, uh, the referendum process in North Dakota, for instance, is a, is a sort of direct democratic check on, uh, and then, you know, we, so we have this, this um, mixed balance, this mixed, this mixed Republic, uh, Republican democracy. It's a sort of core principle of um, political organizing that uh, you can't blame the voters, right? Um, Even when they deserve it. What? Even when they deserve it. (laughs) So I think, uh, you know, what we uh, engage in, in the political sphere is in, in the art of rhetoric and persuasion. Uh, uh, and I don't mean that in a hollow sort of, you know, uh, hollow trickery sort of way, like we can use fancy words and make you believe whatever we want. But in the sense of, you know, uh, when I say um, I don't want politicians in Bismarck uh, telling teachers uh, in the state what books they can teach or what pronouns they can or can't use, uh, that those are sort of fundamental values attacks on uh, the liberty of Americans to speak what they want to dress how they want, to participate how they want. Uh, you know, that's a, I mean, I'm literally on this show, so I'm hoping that people hear and say, oh yeah, you know what? It's like when I read your columns, like, I can't believe I agree with Rob Port. I hope there's some listener out there who's like, I can't believe I agree with Adam Goldwyn. That guy's a Democrat. You know, and uh, uh, so I think we are in the, in the, our job is really to sort of s- s- educate people and say, you know, there are, we believe it in, in core American values. And you talk about, you know, uh, a lot of these processes, um, the, the people think of North Dakota as a red state or as a Republican state. And of course it, uh, you know, even I'm not going to deny that at this point in time, you know, the Republican party has a, uh, uh, the majority of voters, um, are pulling the lever for Republicans. But Democrats get anywhere from a quarter to a third of the statewide vote, and yet we have fewer than ten percent of statewide uh, of the of the state senate, for instance. And that's not uh, a problem with voters, right? That's a problem with legislators gerrymandering. Oh, North boy. Dakota, boy, one of the most brutal voters in the nation. Oh, that's so, that's not even remotely accurate. Wow. Uh, and the, you know, I've been on um, canvassing committees where we have so-called signature match. Uh, I've seen ballots get thrown out where voters' ballots get discounted because a signature they signed on an absentee ballot request form uh, six months earlier, the J curls down instead of up six months later when they fill out their absentee ballot. Well, I can't. So, I, I can't. I can't speak to that. But but lay, lay, you know, laying the blame for where the Democratic MPL is today on gerrymandering is n- not something that's rooted in reality. It is rooted in reality. I'm not again. I'm not saying that the Democrats would have 46 of 47 seats, but four out of 47, when you're winning a quarter to a third of the vote, is represents that. Uh, yeah, the but way but, that these- but you're talking. You're, you're comparing a statewide vote versus an apportioned legislative district by district. Like, uh, I mean, how many of those votes came from Fargo, centered in a few? I mean, there, there's no question that the Democrats in North Dakota are centered in in a, in, in in some some population areas around the state. So, uh, you know, but the legislature is apportioned geographically. So you're, you're comparing apples to oranges, Adam. Well, gerrymandering is the drawing of population into geography in ways that. No, that's just called districting. Well, I mean, redistricting and gerrymandering are uh, uh, interlocked phenomena, right? You must redistrict, but how you draw those districts to dilute the power of your political opposition oh. is what we call it. Yeah. I think that's a fairy tale, but we'll, we'll, we'll save that debate for another day. Well, I, I wanted to ask before we left, cause we have a week, we have a vote coming up this weekend with your opposition party. Uh, the Republicans are electing a new chair. Adam, I was wondering, do you have much interaction with, again, just kind of the behind the scenes. Do you have much interaction with Perry Schaefer? He isn't someone I have heard a lot of or a lot about. Have you ever encountered, uh, his opponent, Sandy, uh, I think it's Sandy Sanford. S- S- Sandy Sanford, uh, or, yeah. Hey there, do you have any, um, want to leave you off, but do you have any commentary on what this, like, seemingly the split within the leadership of the GOP and how it's reflected in the public policy that's impacting North Dakotans' lives directly? 
I mean, honestly, I haven't really put any thought into what Republicans are doing. Uh, and I don't mean that, again, as a cop out. I'm just I'm interested in organizing Democrats and I'm interested in um, helping grow Democratic strength. Uh, you know, I, I would think if you would speak to our legislators, the Dem, Dem and field legislators have more interaction with Republican legislators than sort of uh, party infrastructure, uh, yeah. you know, party infrastructure volunteers like myself have with uh, Republican counterparts. So I'm not following that situation really at all. Sure. And, and that makes sense. I just, uh, you know, for a lot of people, they just never consider running to become a chair of a party and they wonder how that all works. And as you guys were saying previously, what, is there a smoky back room? Do you guys get together? Do you talk? I don't know. I remember when Bob Harms was chair, was chair. he was, uh, he did a lot of outreach, including two Democrats about things that he thought would be better for party organization, for district organization. I can remember Bob Harms coming to Kylie Overson and I on the House floor and saying, State law dictates that we have to have these delegates per precinct, and I don't think the state has any uh, business telling our political parties that. It, it, I just was wondering, you know, if the Democrats agree, we'd like to amend that out. And we both agreed. It was just this funny interaction where, like, the chair of the Republican Party was like, hey, you should we, you know, do this more in a way that, uh, you know, gives autonomy to the political parties? And we said, yeah, sure. And I, I had no idea if that had kept up or what Perry's style was, because I, I, I frequently have to get reminded who Perry Schaefer is. And that's, again... No offense to the man. I, I just don't know him. And I don't yes. hear from him. I don't hear from his style. He, he can come on the show and prove me wrong and, you know, tell me I'm full of it. But I'm guessing he doesn't care what Ben Hansen thinks. Either. Yeah. Well, it's, it's part of that's probably a product of just the declining influence of, of political parties. I mean, a lot of it's candidate driven anymore. And, and it's a little bit and, and no offense to the Democratic MPO. You just don't have you don't have any statewide candidates. And so I think Perry is probably somebody who gets overshadowed by. Governor Burgum and Senator Kramer and Congressman Armstrong and John Holman and some of these other people who are far more prominent than Adam is kind of, you know, obviously there's, there's people like Josh Moshe and stuff who are in, in leadership positions, but it's a little, it's just a different dynamic, I think, for the Dem NPL. But uh, Adam, last words to you and we'll uh, we'll put a pin in it there. Yeah, it's just thanks for having me on. I, I guess I would just say, you know, there there is no, for any listener who wants to get involved in the political process, can't speak for what it's like as a Republican. But for the Dem NPL, you know, there is no there is no back room. There is no smoky room. It's an open door uh, for those who walk in and want to volunteer uh, or want to find a place for themselves um, and helping to shape the future of the state. Uh, you know, just walk in or call or email. And, uh, Do you have to pay to be a voting member of a legislative district party in the Dem NPL, Adam? You do not have to pay. Well, that's interesting because in the District 46 Republican Party, you got to you got to pay your dues in order to um, be a voting member now. Yeah, that's pretty typical. I think, uh, honestly, I, I'm surprised that people get wrapped around the axle about that. That seems like pretty normal practice in most places. Uh, wh but. When you find out why they put it in, what the motivations were from what I've heard from my Hey, local hey, uh, hey if you don't, if, I mean, listen, if you want to talk about chicanery in District 3 up here in Minot, they made it so that you had to be a dues paying member the year previous, right? Yeah. So if you just moved into the district. You could. Yeah, and then they suddenly told so, you. Right, I mean, if you want to be critical of district, if you want to be critical, we're going to get into that. We're going to we're going to let Adam go, and then we'll get into all the chicanery uh, going just, on just, at the district just, level. Adam, thanks for coming on. When yes. Rob Port says, you know, the district two Republicans have a weird sons of liberty thing going on. That's your cue to say, and the district two Dem and PL uh, uh, party believes in liberty. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen, for your time. <laughs> Hi there, my name is James Walner. I produce and host the podcast Dakota Spotlight, a true crime podcast that tackles historical and unsolved crimes in the upper Midwest. Follow along with me as we search for a missing girl, attempt to solve a 45-year-old murder, and much, much more. That's Dakota Spotlight Podcast anywhere you get your podcasts or at inform.com slash podcasts. Okay, just finish up our interview with uh, new Dem NPL chairman Adam Goldwyn, um, who's apparently a fan of my columns. Thank you for reading, Adam. I appreciate it. Uh, you're not doing me any favors by talking about how often you agree with me. I, you know, I people I get that all the time. You know, the whole Hell. the whole Rob Port changed. You're a liberal now, et cetera, et cetera. And I, yeah, Rob, I mean, I mean, I don't. I, I think I think the problem is is some pretty some pretty basic values things have come to the fore in modern politics and i i don't i don't view them as partisan values necessarily i don't treating people with dignity and respect i don't think is is a partisan thing or should be a partisan thing i don't think that 
that book bans should be a partisan thing. We should be against those sorts of things. So, you know, I, I don't know that I've become a liberal just insofar as I'm not willing to follow a lot of Republicans down some rabbit hole where they're abandoning their principles in favor of, you know, sort of the, the culture war politics of, of the moment, right? It's, it's Republicans right now, like you're, you're supposed to be anti-trans, you know, trans is supposed to send you up through, you know, and, and make you super upset. And it just doesn't for me. I it's live and let live for me. I, I don't, um, there, there's a line. I can't remember who said it originally, but I know it got said a lot around Ken Conrad's office, which was, uh, show me your, you know, it was a, what you budget is what you, or what you prioritize shows your values. You can, you know, you can vote on, everyone votes on every bill. You can vote on 60 bills. But when you look at some of, frankly, the young Republican freshmen who we spoke about on length and had a few on the show and what they're prioritizing on social media, what they're talking about, the bills they're prime sponsoring, it, it talks directly to what you're saying. It's not a Ed Schaefer, John Hoven, you know, press release on this tax incentive we feel is going to fill in this many jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Cause that's, you know, I think it's cause it's boring. It doesn't get clicks for them. Yeah. And well, Ed, I mean, down that rabbit hole. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's also not, I mean, depending on what happens at the reorg, you know, this, this cycle where you have Sandy Sanford, who's the wife of former Lieutenant governor, Brent Sanford, who is very active, she she was a founder of of what's called North Dakota Can, which was organized a lot of the, the a lot of the the did a lot of the activism work behind the book ban bills, did a lot of the activism work behind you know like the pronoun bills and some of this stuff. Um, she has been sharply critical of Doug Burgum, particularly during the pandemic, on um, on social media. Uh, the rumor is that that that's part of why Brent Sanford left Governor Burgum's um, uh, administration or before the, before the term was up. So, unconfirmed know, by Brent and the governor, it should be noted. But but I mean the, they they deny but it. But the dots look but, pretty. I mean connected. that's that's the rumor. I good. Thank you for for interjecting that. Um, you know if 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 she you know she's somebody who takes over. The party, I, I think there's going to be a lot of people who are kind of left out in in the cold. Um, but, you know, the party's running scared from it, which which was kind of my point for Adam, too, where the party's running scared from its base. Right. I, it's I, I watch the, the juxtaposition, you know, and I think it's such an interesting comparison because you have Joe Biden and Donald Trump are neither of them are popular. Um, Donald Trump, I mean, they're both polling at like 30% approval. And yet in their respective primary polls, you know, Joe Biden obviously didn't come in, but he is facing a challenge from Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Um, and and yeah. who's, who's that? Ma Marianne Williamson, the other? I think she's yeah, in, in play sure. too. But yeah. he's, he's polling over 50% in the Democratic primary. Mm -hmm. You know, Trump's consistently polling over 50%. Although I did, there was a drop this morning. Um, and maybe that has something I, I to do, do with that. him being, yeah, he's down up, but that was one poll. So who knows did, did, but, in the drop? Did anyone else come up? Did, did like Ron, you know, I, I don't have the numbers. Come right up? Did everybody come up? I, okay. I just look, kind of looked at the top Trump number. I didn't analyze it, yeah. but they have, um, you know, but Trump's consistently been pulling over 50%. Yet both of Either. them are pulling. I mean, so to me, that's a massive disconnect between primary voters, right? The activists, the people who are mm -hmm. the most politically involved and the general electorate. You know, there is a disconnect. And the problem, though, is that the activists are picking the candidates. And then by the time they get to the general electorate, it's basically a binary choice between two but, unpopular yeah. people. And thus far, though, hasn't been a deal breaker for Republican success at the ballot box. But that's thus far. And if I'm if I'm Adam, I'm looking at the this sharp wedge coming up, this crack in the GOP, and I would put. Uh, you know, a chisel between that and slam a hammer behind it if I could. That, that's I mean, what I, I would be going, I'd be going directly to almost not a Republican base, but like, you need a budget for all these things. Nothing's free, nothing's easy. And that, that was my point asking him, you know, what what goes on behind the scenes? How much do you get paid? Because like you guys are saying, the smoky back room, it kind of doesn't exist. There's not a lot of public strings. There's not I would, a lot I of would that. argue the North Dakota Republican Party is being taken over right now precisely because there's no smoky back room. It's a very open process. And whatever else you want to say about the people who have been using it, and there has been some shenanigans along the way that aren't great, 
But for the most mm-hmm. part, it's an open process, and they've taken advantage of it. They're winning. They're I the ones who are showing the up. Chamber, the Chamber of Commerce or the more, maybe not politically active, but definitely Republican you know, business community in these areas and saying, hey, do you like, you know, you guys liked or supported Shan Roars Jones or I knew up in Minot when Andy Marigold essentially got routed by the most fundamentalist element of the Republican Party up in Minot, having been, I think, a pretty good representative for Minot for I don't know how many years. There's example after example of that in my district. In district Senator, Senator, Senator Karen Krebsbach, who was censured by, you know, her yeah. own, her own, you know, probably so, one of the well, most influential them, appropriators in the state is censured well, by her own yeah. party. Going to them and saying, listen, we care about, you know, access and affordability when it comes to child care, which you have all identified as a major workforce issue. We certainly care, and Dem and PL legislators have been putting forward tuition freezes and some kind of ability to wrap our minds and wallets around the cost of higher education. There's a lot of different routes to it, but we've been talking about it. Right now, the new upcoming element wants to talk about, you know, trans bans, book bans, bans, you know, basically just government, government, government banning things in your personal life, in your professional life, wherever it can. And, and we're not, we're not, we're not talking, about, we're not talking about plowing the roads. You know, we're not doing the boring yeah. work. And, and, you know, it's, it's like that they don't like that part of the job. They don't really want to do that part of the job. And, and a lot of them, frankly, are allowed to sort of indulge their, their stupid social agenda because grownups, show up and, and vote for i mean you look a lot of them they vote against these appropriation bills right despite the fact that we have to fund our schools they just vote against everything and they're afforded that luxury because there are still enough adults in the legislature to get the bills passed and they vote about and brag about voting uh brag about voting against most of the economic incentives passed that are some of the you know key you know points in press releases from governor burgum ones that democrats usually wind up voting for i mean it's just it's it's tiring, you know, the, and, and that wedge needs to be yeah. pointed out and driven because I, I think what you're saying about you know might come off to somebody about the election of the Republican chair might come off to of something extremely behind the scenes or in the weeds, but really truly, it's not what you're talking about. If Sandy Sanford becomes the chair, is not it? it it's very much out of the norm. Uh, and what, and you what, don't have a lieutenant governor or a lieutenant governor spouse in Montana or Minnesota that are of the same party as the governor, sharply criticizing them, or in her uh, in her case, floating a floating support for a primary challenge to the sitting congressman. For context, a primary challenge to Kelly Armstrong, the former chair of the North Dakota Republican Party, a, a chairmanship during which they yeah. had unprecedented success. Also, don't, I mean, don't, now she's looking to become yeah. chair. I mean, don't forget Armstrong, Burgum, you know, these people that they're setting, like John Hoven, are winning elections with like high 60, low 70% of the vote consistently, easily. I mean, one landslide election after another. It's clear that North Dakota voters seem to like what they're getting with these people but for some but there's a faction of the party that doesn't like it and you know that's where we're heading and you know part of the reason i wanted to have adam on was to talk about you know is is it is there a potential if people become disillusioned with the ndgop will the democratic npl be a landing place for them and, and i don't know i mean when i hear adam you know this is this is what he said when when doug burgum who by the way on the last election got 68 percent of the vote he said, the last thing the country needs is another bored billionaire whose need for attention is greater than his commitment to the American people as the president of the greatest country of the world. Burgum's presidential candidate campaign will be short, but the harm he has done to North Dakotans will last generations. That last line, do you think the 68% or so of North Dakotans who voted for him, the 70% or so who, who consistently answer approval polls, who say they approve of his, of his job, do they think... Do they think that line, I mean, that line's not going to play with them. This is a person they voted for. I don't think Adam nor anyone who's trying to re- represent or, or rebuild a minority party, and in this case it happens to be the Democratic NPL, are going to get anywhere by trying to be their opposition light. If he gave faint praise or skirt around or didn't directly address and frankly attack because he's the chair of the opposition party, the governor who is now running for president, you're not going to draw any kind of distinction or contrast. And, and think back even to 
Doug Burgum's uh, initial primary campaign in 2016, he was sharply critical sure. of his own party yeah. because you have you have to draw a distinction. If he had come out and simply said, yeah, it looks pretty good, which, you know, he's not going to say that. But there's no there is no tightrope that someone in his role could walk that would satisfy everybody and anybody including so you have to create the narrative and drive the narrative He's okay but, but the narrative had the narrative has to, to be rooted in in reality the harm doug burgum's done north dakotans will last there, generations there, there, plenty, there were protesters outside of, i went to the presidential announcement there are protesters outside of them were they as big as the protest as the people inside not necessarily there were, there were, there were, there were 11 somewhere there were 11 outside yeah. and I, yeah. I mean i'm not i'm not i'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying somewhere. i'm not saying i'm talking about a political party that wants to retake or try to retake or mm -hmm. or have even a smaller minority presence i don't think this is the way and I, every cycle i hear this well you know we got to go on every i mean um every chair has done this previously this isn't an adam goldwin thing you know they've all attacked like this and they all continue to, to, I mean, at some point you keep doing the same thing over and over again. Do you think you're going to get a different result? But, but the alternate, what was the alternate though? The alternate can't be, uh, yeah, Doug's running for president. That's interesting. Like you can't just, say I think nothing. the alternate is maybe something silent. like, I like, like, like house minority leader. Well, former house minority leader, Josh Boucher. This is what he posted about Bergam running on Twitter. I wish at Doug, Doug, Ber I wish Doug Bergam the best of law. I said at I'm reading his tweet. I wish Doug Burgum the best as he begins his run to be the GOP presidential candidate. There is much he and I disagree on, but we both agree our country would be well would be served well if the GOP selected a moderate Republican like Doug over the extreme ones they've advanced lately. See, I thought that was very nice. And I, I think that sort of tone is going to be more winning with people with people who are becoming disillusioned with the Republican Party, I think would would be more comfortable turning to somebody like Josh Boucher. And the way he talks about politics than somebody like Adam Goldwyn, and and I, I say that I'm not ripping on Adam. I know is I know if you're the chair, you're kind of the party's attack dog, but I'm just saying I think the Boucher approach is better. I just I don't think that's his role, and I don't think you can draw a distinction there. If if you're just saying yeah us too or that's interesting, you're just going to get lost. And and if I'm a Democratic activist or looking to my chair to provide some leadership, if you're I, if I were a Republican activist, I'd be confused and wondering where Perry yeah, Schaefer you, yeah. is when the more extreme either either I agree with the Sandy Sanfords of the world and wondering why Perry isn't there, or I disagree with her and I'm wondering, hey Perry, where the heck are you? Yeah, and the party I, it, it was it was kind of it was never talked to, it was kind of funny. The NDGOP sent out their press release about Bergen running for president like 24 hours after he announced, like, like the news had broke, everybody had covered it. And all of a sudden here popped up in my inbox, a statement from Perry Schaefer, like 24 or 36 hours later. What was the like statement? I, I didn't, cause I oh never, my gosh. Uh, hold on. I could pull it up here. Cover see, me. See, the see right here. The two of us are as in the weeds as it gets. And we can't remember what Perry Schaefer said about Doug Burnham running for office. We can remember what Adam said that, that right there. <laughs> okay. So this, this came out. When did he, when did he announce? He announced his, uh, one week ago. He, well, yeah, he announced, he announced on uh, Wednesday, a week ago, the seventh, this press release landed in my inbox, June 8th at 8 41 PM. Um, <laughs> and that's it, time to put a press release. Right. And it said, uh, this was this was Perry Schaefer's statement. Governor Doug Burgum's announcement to run as North Dakota's first Republican presidential candidate on the platforms of economy, energy, and national security offers a unique option for voters within the state nationally. A large, diverse number of candidates reinvigorates the national political arena on multiple levels, not only for Lost. voters, but for the energy of the race. And blah, blah, blah. Governor Burgum's entry into the race holds significant value for the state of North Dakota. So, not a, and I understand also, like, like it's... It would, when you're the party and you have multiple Republican candidates running, the party can't itself can't really take sides, even though it's a hometown guy. I get that. Sure, but like, what? I, boy, would you like some mayo on your toast? I, I like. And, all, and also, <laughs> also, also coming, coming like, like more than like 36, like I said, about 36 hours after the announcement. Um, you know, I, that's, that's, that's not great. I, you know, when Adams said Doug Bergen was a bored billionaire running for office, it's mean, but then it's up to Doug. But, you know, Doug's a big boy. He can just go out and prove Adam wrong by showing us what distinguishes him from the field. Do you think in this? So he announced a week ago. I know because yeah. I 
got to be there. It was uh, fun being at the event. It was fun seeing all we the did locals. A, we did a podcast I, basically almost, the, almost from the venue. And then I ran to the back room of shout out to Atomic Coffee in downtown Fargo and recorded a podcast with you. I uh, just, I, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe he's announced. Do you think he's distinguished himself from the field as a necessary entry into the race? Not yet. Um, you know, there's race. I mean, he's starting to show up in the polls at 1%. That's what he needs. Um, he needs contributions. He needs to get on the debate stage. And I think that'll be the inflection point. If he makes the debate stage, he's got to, he's got to make an impression I, there. And if he doesn't, want, he's, he's, he's done. I really wonder if that's the right bet. Do debate stages matter anymore? Especially when your front runner is very likely to skip. I and think, do a I think when your name attention? recognition is effectively zero, yes, it matters a great deal. Um, if you debate, got, yeah. I, I think I think he, I think he has to. I think for Doug Burr, and I'm I'm not talking about you know the strategy for all the candidates. I'm talking about the strategy for Doug Burgum. Um, he's yeah. got to make he's got to get on that debate stage. And and also want, by the by yeah. the way, in two weeks there's going to be an FEC report due. It, the, the due date's the 30th, which means we'll probably get the report sometime that next week. Um, and he's got to have convincing numbers in that report. There's just and. Yeah, he's got to show up. And well, let's talk about uh, money for a little for a second here. Sure. Doug has spent two point was it six million dollars? Two point four, two point six, something like that, on his first TV yeah. buys in Iowa and New Hampshire. Mo- Focus mostly on on Iowa. I think I think more than half of it was in Iowa. Now, now here's some context for that, and it's not it's not apples it, it's apples to oranges. I'll cop to that. But let me let me. So when I worked on Tim Mathern's gubernatorial campaign. He ran for governor against Hoven in 2008. We were obviously, you know, a dark horse candidate at, at, the, uh, at best. And we ran, I believe, a TV ad that got statewide coverage in an unbusy media market. Uh, and for two weeks of TV, it cost $60,000. Doug Burgum is up for with a two weeks of TV and radio in Iowa at about one point two five million dollars, right? Yeah. One and a half million. But obviously, it's, now it's, again, it's again, Iowa. years have passed. It's a it's a busier media market, but it's a bigger it's a bigger million, media market. I mean, what's what's Iowa's population? Five million? About four times ours. Uh, a little less than that. That's about Minnesota's that. okay. population. I think it's like three point eight. But okay. The, the, but but you know, it is a bigger media market. But that one one point five million dollars, aka amount of money most people won't see in their lifetime is being spent on two weeks worth of ads. So he is carpet bombing the same uh, media wise, the same way he carpet bombed. But one of, one of the reason it costs more is because so, so is his competition. You know, they're up with TV ads too. They're, they're running They're They're but also, he's, my understanding was he's outspending everyone right now in Iowa. It could right? be, um, that could that's be findable I information. Not, I thought I saw it on CVS. I should look that up. That could be, so, that, that could very well be true. But I, I think that's a really good point. If you want to talk about how competitive, Doug Burgum can be financially, absolutely, he can be competitive. Now, the the thing is, is it's not you don't just spend money and then magically get support. You have to spend money in pursuit of the right message. I mean, we have Donald Trump spent far less than Hillary Clinton did, and Hillary Clinton lost, although she won the popular vote. Maybe that's not a great comparison. Michael Bloomberg, you know, outspent everybody when he ran that's for president. That's the interesting comparison. Now, there's a couple of differentiating factors. Doug is getting in way before Michael Bloomberg. Michael, Blo- that was the, the that that he truly waited. was a, that truly was a bored billionaire just looking at a field and deciding one day and consulting no one. I could do better than them and spending how what was it like? There's a quarter of a billion dollars running nationally to win three delegates and get promptly shooed out of the race. Uh, having and again having not been. Uh, 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 certainly not a lifelong Democrat, just in general, not really identifying with the party and gee, what a surprise, therefore not getting a lot of support from Democrats, which, you know, one plus one equals two, Michael. Doug is, you know, spent time and has signed very conservative bills uh, and has that pedigree. So I think he will be the board, suspiciously I think, by their I, by I, the, uh, I, I, party I, base, but I wonder if they're convinced. Yeah, I think the board billionaire appellation to Doug Burgum is, is unfair in two ways. First of all, his campaign tells me he's not a billionaire. They say he has nine figure wealth. Everyone calls him a billionaire. Oh, I think that, whatever. I think it's that money probably, I'll never see, and most people will never he's, see. He's, he's, I, I, I realize. I, I just I want to make it clear. They say he's not a billionaire. If if sure. I, I don't have a way to say one way or the other. I you know maybe he should release his tax returns. But 
I don't have. Well, I mean, I don't he's have, gonna have to if he's running. I don't have that information. I can't imagine they deny it if it if it if, if it wasn't. I I don't know why they would lie about that. Um, sure. So I, I can't I imagine I why. That, I'm, I'm willing. Lying, I'm willing. I'm willing to take their word at it. I think it's probably a distinction without a difference. But and, and everyone's going to call him a billionaire anyway. So I I don't. But I'm I'm trying to be accurate. He's not a billionaire. But the other thing is, I don't think he's doing this because he's bored. I think Doug Burgum's ambitions are very real. Um, I think I think I think when he ran for governor, he wasn't just you know he was very involved, much more so than a lot of his critics, including me. Thought he was going to be. Um, yeah. I think he. I think he really wants this. And I, I think he's motivated. But agree with his policies or not, I think his motivations are pure. And I have now that I've watched his hustle, I've watched the campaign messaging um, because he spent. He immediately ha- he had a event that got at least decent coverage locally, got so so coverage nationally. But there's only so much you can help. And I've also, also, I mean, it was that was a, that was a crowded week too. Christie announced, Pence announced. There was a lot yeah. going on. Um, what, I mean, if you really want to get into the big leagues, you could argue that there are more dexterous campaigns that could maneuver around that, but he chose not to, uh, but he immediately jumped in a plane, I assume, and got to Iowa, did a lot of events, got plenty of media, plenty of video, uh, you know, had full on slow motion shots of him throwing baseballs and cooking pork in Iowa. You know, there you go. And at a diner in New Hampshire. And then in New Hampshire with governor Sununu there. So he's, he's not, so I've been fully convinced he's not running for a cabinet position that combined with Donald Trump's, you know, pledge that if you're running against me, you ain't going to work for me. And right. Donald Trump says a lot of things. I, I don't think, I, I think, I think even if, if Ron DeSantis is the nominee and ultimately wins the white house, I don't think Doug Burgum, I mean, first of all, serving in the Trump cabinet is, is likely to get you indicted. I mean, that's, that's the reality. I, I don't know that there are very many alumni of the yeah. Take, take a look at Rex administration and a long, successful career in the oil industry, and then a short, really crappy one. Who are I, I, right? I don't. I don't know a lot. I don't know a lot of people who joined the Trump administration. We're feeling now like that was a good idea. Um, and and he's smart enough to see that. Not, I, so uh, I don't. Th- but yeah. I don't. I don't think Doug Burgum. Even if even if it's President Nikki Haley, I don't know that Doug Burgum wants a cabinet position. I think he wants to be president. I, I agree with you. But, but what's what is the distinction that he is making? Two points on that. One, through no fault of his own, we don't know a whole lot about his foreign policy stances. That's because he was a businessman who did international business and therefore would not want to upset an apple cart. And again, I do not blame him for that. And two, he was a governor and therefore most of his foreign policy interaction was the Canadian border because he borders his state border sure. Canada. Now he's put out a couple of statements. Uh, one of them is direct. I'm going to rebuild the military um, to, win, to the cold, fight, win the Cold War with China. A Cold War that we're apparently having with China. It's an interesting one because, well, you know, what other Cold Wars are we having? What other... Uh, he is in national interviews, in my opinion, correctly named America's adversaries but then the natural follow through, which is the leading president you know, nominee and my political party has been extremely chummy, both in rhetoric and in personal meetings with leaders of these countries who I am naming as America's enemies. Yeah. Wouldn't that result in some kind of criticism of the front runner? And we'll see, he that's, will not say yeah. Trump's name to save his life. Well, that, that was the other thing. And I brought, so far, the, I brought, so that, I brought that up at a column. Yeah. You know, he, he went on the good morning America. He went on good morning. went on the good morning America. Went on good morning America. He went on the TV. And it was like, it was like, gee, it was like good morning America three, which I don't even know what that is. There, there's three iterations of good morning America now. I don't I didn't know that. Right. I don't know. Uh, that was what it was. GMA three is what it was called. I haven't, I, you can tell how much I watch television. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. So anyway, but he was on there and they were interviewing him and they kept they kept asking him, you know, well, Trump was indicted, you know, you know, giving him opportunities to 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 criticize the front runner. And he just he dodges it. He won't say I, to this point. I don't know that he has said Donald Trump's name in a critical in a critical way on the campaign trail. And that is that is astounding to me. The man is under the man is under federal name. the man is under federal indictment. You are you are literally taking up policy positions that are opposed to him. You are naming China and Russia 
as as enemies to be resisted by the United States. Donald Trump's their friends. And North Korea. And North and, Korea yeah. and, and Iran. Donald Trump has a beautiful love letter from the leader of North Korea and, and, and really oh. respects how much uh, his cabinet members stand at attention right. when he commands people in North Korea. Right. He, he meanwhile, really meanwhile North Koreans are starving to death, but sure. Um, mm -hmm. Sure, the people who are afraid of being shot for showing insufficient deference to dear leader. Um that's that's it's, what's, it's, what it's a wonderful thing for the American. Completely unnecessary, harmful hostilities towards our allies, what a, uh, Korea or South Korea and Japan. What a wonderful thing for the American president to, to praise. So, yeah, I mean, but that, that's the thing. I don't understand. If you're going to take positions that are distinct from Donald Trump, I'm not saying you got to call the guy names. Right. I'm not saying that you have to do what Trump does and come up with a nickname for him or something like that. Just say. Listen, it's problematic. Well, in fact, please don't. You know, it's it, it, you. I mean, you can even say, "Listen, Donald Trump's going to have his day in court, but boy, it's going to be tough to win a national election when you're under indictment, right?" I mean, you can I, even yeah. you can even say, "I," you know, I, I think it's fair to say, it's fair to question: Is the Department of Justice applying the law equally when Mike Pence and Hillary Clinton, and some of these other people who had classified documents or, or were were loosey goosey with with the nation's secrets, didn't face? consequences i think that's a fair question to ask you can also say that doesn't excuse anything that donald trump did he had he had national security information that could risk our relationship with our allies our ability to keep our country safe our men and women in the clandestine services our men and women on in in the military all of those documents could endanger them he had them stored in a bathroom at mar-a-lago i'm sorry I, yeah. you, I, I don't think I don't understand why you can't talk about that and say that's a problem. And when you're choosing to run for president aggressively, and I mean that as a compliment, and you're choosing your top three platform points, and one of them is national security, when someone, a former president who's running for president, currently against you for the nomination, uh, has this big of a national security breach and lies about it, which is now on record, his lawyers have now abandoned him. You can't ignore that. That's more than, it's not even an elephant in a room. It's a, I don't know what, Godzilla in the room? Yeah. I, my metaphors are stupid. Listen, I'm, 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 not, I'm not some highly paid, nobody's going to pay me to advise their campaign. I'm just a lowly newspaper columnist from North Dakota. And, but I, I got to tell you, if, if, I'm, if I'm the candidate, and I want to get name. How do you set yourself apart from the pack? Well, maybe be one of the few That's candidates, Chris, Chris Christie being the other one, maybe be the candidate who's willing to name Donald Trump when you're criticizing him. And maybe be the candidate to point out, look at all the people who Donald Trump has hired who don't like him now. All the people that he appointed to his administration who don't like him now, including Nikki Haley, who was um, ambassador to the United Nations, who's now running against Donald Trump, although she has her own adventures with with how to criticize him, but she's not being very critical. And, I, I and just, when we talk about fixing a crazy economy, which is a from his again from his ad, and we talk about you know there's a standard Republican line, you know, as a business person, the way the government spends is driving me crazy. Well, again, Donald Trump's your main competition. How many trillions of dollars? What percentage of the national debt was added to during the Trump administration? It was over twenty percent of the total national debt. It was trillions. It was a five trillion. I can't remember. Yeah. This was not. I would love to hear a Republican say, "No, we're going to take a real belt tightening stance." Yeah. I'm going to show. I I thought this was a failure. We'll talk about Donald Donald station. Trump accumulated more, more national debt in four years than Barack Obama did in eight. That's a great line for a Republican say it out loud. candidate. You say know, say, but, say it out know. loud. I mean, say, uh, yeah, it's it is. Uh, and you 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 don't have to say it the way that this Democrat wants you to say it. You can say, "I'm so." You can couch about the credit it. card bill we're swiping on our grandchildren, and Donald Trump was part of that, and we need someone in there who's going to be an adult in the room. You could say no, Donald really, Trump was beat. I mean, if you want, John, Joe Biden already beat Donald Trump once. He can beat him again. We need somebody different. We need somebody yeah, different well, to run against Joe right Biden. Now, right now, where the conspiracy theorists are with the base and the percentage they have, I'm not saying it's the... It's not a majority of the American people, but it's unfortunately a good well, chunk of people that show up to caucuses or primaries. I, mean, I don't I, even know if it's a majority there, but it's too big. And and frankly, the candidates right now running against Trump are too scared, with the exception I, of 
Christy, who is doing a kamikaze nosedive. Yeah, well, Chris, Christy, Christy's, Christy, whatever else you want to say about Chris Christie, the man is engaged in an act of civic hygiene. Somebody has to do it. I'm glad he's yeah. doing it. He's telling yeah, the truth. So, good, more power yeah. to him. Whatever whatever else he's guilty of in his so, political career, you, this is a good thing. Yeah. And um, you, you may not want to get paid for advising a campaign, but as a volunteer podcast co-host, I will gladly be paid to advise their campaign. So I, you know, I'm sure the, I'm sure the calls to, will come rolling in. I'd have to, I'd have to give up my day job as a columnist, and I, I love my day job, and and I can, <laughs> I can give them advice anyway. I just, I'll just write it up in a column and send it over. But I, I do not understand. Like if Doug Burgum wanted to make a splash in this race, say the man's name. Over and over again, he's the front runner. He's got over he's over fifty percent of the polls. One poll after another. Talk about why he can't be the nominee again. And Burgum did not hesitate criticizing sharply, and I thought sometimes incorrectly, the sitting Attorney General Wayne Stenger when he ran for the primary. So what makes this different now? It's interesting. It's clearly intentional, but clearly the two of us don't like it. Yeah. Well, you know, and and again, again, I think he's afraid if he criticizes. I mean. What and part of the quandary is? What do you do when when the voters are acting irrationally, right? Because because democracy is rooted in the idea that voters are going to act rationally. They're going to make rational decisions. Continuing to support somebody who's under federal indictment for for mishandling yeah. you know state secrets, I, among other things. I mean, all the other problems continue is not a rational decision. You know, yeah, well, initiative is a uh, something I can't say on air, but take the initiative. Take start being the the thing at the front of the big boat that breaks up the ice. There, you know, you can see how sophisticated Ben shipping the, um the icebreaker. I think that's yeah, literally just, called the icebreaker. Just the icebreaker. Okay, okay we'll be the icebreaker at the tip of the ship. If the ship's gonna move forward, sometimes you gotta break up some ice. Do it. Take the you know, be it's easy for me to say sitting on the sidelines. I just I, I when you're when you're Doug Burgum and you're pulling at zero or one percent consistently. I don't think you can afford to be timid. I don't. No. I don't. I think. I think. I think if you're waiting for your opening or something, I think that's a good way to lose and see Donald Trump be the nominee again. I think you got to go for it. But well, we got a big. We got a big uh, election uh, for North Dakota politics this weekend. If we can, I'd love to have the chair on. Uh, whoever becomes chair next week. Well, I'm gonna. Willing. I'm gonna try. So the plan right now. I don't know who the chair is gonna be, so I can't very well book them. But yeah. Um, we are not, we, I have been, we started doing uh, a new episode of the show on Fridays with Chad Oban. Um, we're actually going to push that to Monday this time because we're going to have Kelly Armstrong on former chair of the party. We're going to talk about a lot of this stuff that's happening in the house of representatives. I'm sure we'll talk some about what's happening in the North Dakota Republican party because we'll know by then some of what happened, but that'll be coming up. So, so no show Friday. Instead, that show will be Monday, and it'll be a little out, a little bit later in the day than usual because we'll be recording it at like 3 p.m. Um, we had to kind of work with the the congressman's schedule a little bit, but um, yeah. So that'll be uh, that'll be Monday. Look out for that. And for today, thanks for listening. Thanks to the guest Adam Goldwyn, who was a good sport to come on and and, and have me harangue him. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I harangued him. I thought it was a nice conversation, but I just it's good good to get out there. Sharply disagree with him on some things, but maybe that's uh, maybe that's that's a given. All right, thanks for listening. We'll talk again. Did you know Forum Communications Company has a robust podcast library? At inform.com forward slash podcasts, we have everything from politics, sports, true crime, outdoor adventure, and more. Visit inform.com forward slash podcasts and explore them all today.